1966, two middle-aged men were found dead lying side by side in a field in Brazil. There were no obvious signs of injury. If that's not odd enough, the men were wearing a formal suit, a waterproof coat, and lead eye masks with no holes. How did they die? Was it suicide or murder? Why did they die? And what were they doing in that field, wearing such strange attire? For nearly 60 years, the lead masks case, as it is famously known, has remained unsolved. Join us as we investigate their deaths and the various theories surrounding it to determine what most likely happened. On August 17, 1966, just three days before their deaths, Miguel José Viana and Manuel Pereira de Cruz, electronic technicians from Campos dos Goitacazes, left to buy some materials for work. At least, that's what they told their families. The police were able to determine that they took a bus to Niteroi, arriving at around 2 p.m. Once there, they purchased identical raincoats at a shop, as well as one bottle of water from a local bar. The men kept a receipt for the bottle, which suggests that they planned to return it later for the refund. From this, we can infer that they didn't plan on dying atop a hill that day. A waitress at the bar stated that Miguel seemed very nervous, frequently checking his watch. It gave the impression that they were running late for something. She was one of the last people to see them alive, as the police believed that the men traveled directly from the bar to the location where they were found dead. On the afternoon of August 20th, a young boy named Jorge da Costa Alves went to Vintam Hill in Niteroi, Rio de Janeiro, to fly a kite. As he wandered around the area, he discovered two bodies in the weeds. He reported the matter to the authorities. However, the rough terrain made it difficult for the police to reach the bodies immediately. It wasn't until the following day that they arrived at the scene. The police saw two men lying side by side. They were dressed in matching formal suits and waterproof coats. They were also wearing masks with no eye holes handcrafted out of lead. Take note that these masks weren't the same as the protective masks typically used to protect against radiation. These looked more like homemade blindfolds. The masks covered the eyes completely, but left the rest of the face exposed. Since the masks didn't have eye holes, it left the wearer unable to see anything. Aside from the bodies, the police also saw several objects alongside the men. A packet containing two wet towels, a plastic bag containing an empty water bottle and its receipt, a bit of cash, far less than what they were thought to have carried, and a notebook. Some reports state that it wasn't a notebook. Instead, the police found notes stashed inside one of the men's pockets. In any case, the police found several lists of parts and information related to the men's work on one of the pages. On another, they found a set of cryptic instructions. Translated to English, the instructions stated, 1630 be at the specified location, 1830 ingest capsules, after the effect, protect metals, await signal mask. The bodies were inspected and found that there were no signs of trauma. There was no evidence of a struggle, even on the field. The police were unable to determine an obvious cause of death. There was a reference to capsules in the notes which might indicate poison. However, the coroner's office was too busy, overwhelmed with work. It took weeks before the autopsy was conducted. By that time, the internal organs were already too badly decomposed to be tested. Due to this delay, the coroner was unable to perform a toxicology test on the bodies. That being said, the police didn't make a big issue out of it. They didn't think that there was any foul play involved. Due to the presence of the lead masks, the bodies were tested for radiation, but the results didn't show any abnormalities. The coroner eventually ruled the deaths as unexplained cardiac arrest. Apparently, the two men lay down on the field together and just died peacefully. Since there were no clues left on the bodies, the police turned to investigating the men themselves. Miguel was 34 years old, while Manuel was 32. Both men were natives of Campos dos Goitacazes, which is just northeast of Rio de Janeiro and 175 miles away from Niteroi. 
they were both married. According to their families, the two men were going to Sao Paulo to buy equipment and a cheap used car. They brought a hefty amount of cash with them. The trail led the police to the store where the men bought raincoats and the bar from where the water bottle came from. From the bar, the two men were seen heading into the hills around 3.15 p.m. There are some accounts that suggest the men were seen riding in a jeep along with one to three unknown persons. Three days later, Pereira de Cruz and Viana were found dead, and the trail stops there. Of course, the police also searched the workshop of Pereira de Cruz and Viana. Amidst their tools, scraps of lead and other materials, they found extensive notes on spiritualism, or what we might call New Age science. The police also found a book on scientific spiritualism written by Bezerra Gemenezes, passages in the book that referred to masks, intense luminosity, and accompanying spirits were marked. The investigation also revealed that the two men might have been members of a group of scientific spiritualists. Apparently, scientific spiritualism was quite popular among the local electronic technicians. They were interested in beings from higher planes of reality, telepathic communication with extraterrestrials, hallucinogenic drug use, and even seances. The wife of Pereira de Cruz confirmed that the men were both interested in contacting alien spirits, and they had even tried to do this multiple times with their friend Elcio Gomez. The man had even built an electronic device for this purpose. Apparently, the three men tried to use the device at Atafona Beach, where they claimed to have witnessed an explosion in the sky. Later, the device they built blew up in Pereira de Cruz's backyard. Pereira de Cruz's wife also stated that Gomez had a fight with her husband. When interviewed by the police, he told them contradictory stories, which made him a potential suspect. According to Gomez, they were members of a secret society that was devoted to spiritism. The three of them regularly attended seances. Pereira de Cruz and Viana were both hopeful that they would be able to communicate with beings on Mars. Moreover, they collaborated in many electronic experiments in Manuel's backyard, where, as the wife testified, there was an explosion. Once the neighbors knew of Gomez's testimony, many also came forward to talk about the massive explosion that caused walls to shake. While the police were still investigating the case, an imprisoned gangster named Hamilton Bezani confessed to helping rob and kill Pereira de Cruz and Viana. He met them at a spiritualism center and lured them to Niteroi. According to Bazzani, he and his accomplices offered to sell radioactive material to the two men. They also gave them capsules, supposedly for protecting them against radiation, but contained poison. They told the two that they can get the goods in Moho. They waited for the men to go up the hill and drink the poison. Afterwards, they retrieved the cash. So the police interviewed Viana's widow about the missing cash. She confirmed that he initially told them that he would be buying a used car. However, he didn't actually bring a lot of money with him. Just before leaving, he confessed to his wife that he was taking a trip to Niteroi to perform some kind of experiment with Pereira de Cruz. According to a cousin of his, he said that when he gets back, he'll tell his cousin whether or not he believes in spiritualism. As for Bazzani's story, there was nothing that could back it up. In fact, the police thought that he was confessing so that he could be moved to the prison in Niteroi, which was supposedly easier to escape from. In the end, the police couldn't find anything else to explain why the two men went into the hills. The mystery continues to baffle people today. All we really know is that Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel José Viana had a mission in mind when they went to Vintam Hill. They were dressed to the nines, wore their raincoats, and slipped the masks over their eyes. As their world went dark, they probably didn't know that they would never be able to see the light of day again. It's been nearly six decades since the death of Pereira de Cruz and Viana, and many questions still remain unanswered. Was it or an elaborately staged murder? Were the men part of a doomsday cult? Did this case involve time travel or something as serious as a nuclear reactor? 
The lead mask case has no shortage of theories. The most popular one is that the men wanted to contact extraterrestrials. Vinterm Hill was a location of several supposed sightings of strange aerial lights, which is why the men went there. A friend of the two men claimed that the men belonged to a secret religious cult of scientific spiritualists, which was experimenting with psychedelic drugs. It is speculated that the men ingested capsules containing a hallucinogenic substance to perform a weird religious ritual that would help them get in touch with extraterrestrials. They also believed that they would be exposed to blinding light during the encounter, so they created lead masks to shield their eyes. Since this case took place in the 60s, when the use of psychedelic drugs was considered a recreational activity, it's plausible that the men took a very high dose of a drug, which caused them to die. To further support this theory, there was even an account of another technician who had died mysteriously atop a different hill four years earlier. He too was wearing a lead mask when he was found. According to reports, a man named Hermes also died on the Mojo de Vintem. He also had no apparent cause of death, no injuries on his body. In addition, no toxicology was performed, so poison couldn't be ruled out. The police reopened the case of Hermes, but they didn't find any connection between the two cases. All three men going to Vinterm Hill to telepathically communicate with aliens and dropping dead while doing so didn't seem to be something that entered into their consideration. An article in Folha de Sao Paulo by a professor of yoga suggested that the men used drugs such as LSD-25 or mescaline to increase their mental alertness and boost the frequency of the brain to carry out their telepathic experiment. While there isn't much evidence to support this theory, there is one account that leads a bit of credence to it. A respected lady of the upper class, Gracinda Barbosa Cochinha de Souza, gave a testimony to Officer Betancourt that she was driving along Alameda São Boaventura in Fonseca with three of her children on the evening of the 17th, the day the men went to Vinterm Hill. According to her account, her seven-year-old daughter Denise told her to look up at the sky over the Mojo de Vinterm. When she did, Gracinda saw an orange-colored oval object with what seemed to be a line of fire around its edges. The object was hovering atop the hill. She stopped the car and observed the object carefully. It rose and fell vertically for three or four minutes, leaving a well-defined blue ray. Now remember that this is the 60s. It was considered uncouth to talk about UFOs in Brazil at the time. But this woman, who had a good reputation among her peers, was willing enough to give her account to the police. After her testimony was taken, more witness accounts started coming in. All of the reports seemed to agree that there was an oval orange-colored shape over the hill emitting blue rays, and the time of this incident seemed to coincide with the two men's time of death. Another theory aiming to explain this mystery is that the men were trying to sell illegal radioactive materials to people in the criminal underworld, quite similar to Bazzani's confession. Unfortunately, the deal went wrong, and they were killed before getting dumped on Vinterm Hill. The criminals arranged the scene in such a way that the police wouldn't be able to solve the case. While we don't have much evidence to definitively unravel this mysterious case, there is little to indicate that this theory holds any water. Another far-fetched theory proposed by some is that the strange instructions were given to the men by aliens. They were asked to wear protective gear and drink the capsules to protect them from radiation. Because this theory involves extraterrestrials, we can't really get any proof that the men were following the orders of aliens. So, what do we think really happened? Based on the evidence found by the police, we can say that the men were very interested in New Age science and UFOs, based on the testimonies of family and friends, as well as evidence found in their workshop. Moreover, they went to Vinterm Hill because they planned to find out the truth about scientific spiritualism. Let's take a look at the other evidence. The men were electronics technicians. It's safe to say 
that they wouldn't regularly wear formal suits to work. So, why would they be wearing something that is outside of their usual attire? It's quite possible that they wanted to impress someone that they were going to meet, someone important enough that they had to dress up. Since they had to go up some difficult terrain, it's safe to say that whoever they were planning to meet, it wasn't some business acquaintance. So it is plausible that they believe that they were meeting with heavenly beings that they wanted to impress in a location that was known for UFO sightings. Now, many think that the men were wearing lead masks because they were expecting to be exposed to radiation. Aside from the fact that there was no radiation detected at the crime scene, why would they only wear something to protect their eyes? What about the rest of their body? Since they were wearing masks that only covered their eyes, it's safe to assume that they were expecting to be exposed to some blinding light. As far as the wet towels and raincoats, there's simply no explanation we could find for this. Maybe you could let us know your thoughts in the comments. Most of the mystery revolving around the lead masks case are the notes and the capsules. We've already established why the men went there, but who wrote the notes? Were they meeting a fellow enthusiast or hoping for an event to take place? Yes, Vinterm Hill has been a location where people have caught sight of unexplained aerial phenomena, but there's no other evidence that could be found to explain why the men picked that particular place. And why they seem to be in such a hurry when there were still three hours before the stated time in the notes. In fact, we're not even sure if the notes refer to that day. And then there was the phrases, protect the metals and wait for mask signal. Were they protecting some metals that they brought and were taken away? Was there a signal that told them when they should put on the masks? If that's the case, then who would have sent them the signal in such a remote place? What about the capsules? What was in them? For all we know, these could have been vitamins or food supplements. Or, as many speculate, they really could be hallucinogenic drugs. We will never know. Based on the results of the investigations conducted by police, journalists and amateur detectives, here's what we think most likely happened. The men were interested in life outside the planet, and they believed that there was a way to contact them. They probably had a high opinion of these beings, which led them to dress up so formally. Why was their trip so clandestine? Possibly because they didn't want to tell their families that they were going to conduct a telepathic experiment. Maybe they didn't want to get laughed at or dissuaded from going through with their plans. The notes might be reminders for themselves of what they need to do when they reach the agreed place. Since they belong to a scientific spiritualist collective, it's possible that they got ideas from some of the members on where to go, what time is best, and how to reach a state where telepathy was possible. The raincoats might have been used as some form of protection as they traveled through the rough terrain until they reached the top of Vinterm Hill, and the masks, as we've mentioned, may have just been protection from a blinding light. We've all seen how UFOs suddenly shoot out a huge blinding white light over humans in movies and television. It isn't impossible for UFO enthusiasts to conclude that they might need some eye protection. More importantly, it's not out of the realm of possibility that they purchased psychedelic drugs to help them achieve that mental state. It's just that they probably overestimated the dosage. So, why were they lying so peacefully on the weeds? We're not sure, but our best guess is that it may have been part of their experiment. There were no obvious signs of foul play on the plants surrounding the bodies, which indicated that they chose to lie down there. It's just that they probably never thought that something would go wrong with their experiment. They probably thought that it was possible that they would fail to achieve contact, but they most likely didn't think that they'd die there. So, our belief on what most likely happened on that fateful day in 1966 is accidental death. Simple and boring. Not as intriguing as murder, but it's what the evidence indicates. Now, as to whether there were really aliens that night, that's another mystery for another time. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch, Brought to you by Bad Things.